Hi everybody and welcome to today's digital event and thank you for your patience while we fix the uh, the technical issue there. Thank you for bearing with us. Um, today we are here to um, watch the menopause supporting women we work with through their careers digital event. Um, you've already been interacting with each other using the chat box to the right of your screen so please continue to do so. Uh, we are recording today's session and the link will be shared with those who book to attend following the event. Uh, now I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Heather the Melville, Chair of CMI Women, who will be chairing today's session, and our panellists, Claire Tunley, Chief Executive Financial Services Skills Commission, and Tanuj Kapilashrami, Group Head of Human Resources at Standard Chartered Bank. Now I'm going to hand over to Heather to begin the event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us, giving up your lunch hour to talk about something that is really prevalent and important to us in business today. I'm joined by Tanaji and Claire, and actually one of the things that is really important for us at CMI Women, we are really focused on developing the world's strongest pipeline of female managers and leaders. We provide our members with a comprehensive schedule of events and networking opportunities like today to enable them to access support through a comprehension schedule of events, networking events, access to support through our online career development platform and of course our CMI mentoring platform. But our network is not just exclusive to women. We encourage men to join and act as allies and agents of change to become everyday champions of women at work because we, are all, we all appreciate it takes everyone working together to make real lasting change happen. And inclusive, balanced workplaces are more productive and create the best working environments. And what I will say on our board for seeing my women that I chair, we have two senior men that are our committee members. So just showing you that the world for us is that this is not just a, a women's environment, but it's a business environment for everybody to actually contribute to and learn from. CMI Women has all organized this event predominantly to raise awareness um, on the menopause and how it affects women in the workplace and in their careers. It's important to talk about the menopause as it, affects, as it directly affects 51% of the population, but it also indirectly impacts the rest of the population in some way, with menopausal women being the fastest growing demographic in the workplace. It's important that employers create a supportive environment. This event will give you more awareness and information about how you as managers and leaders or aspiring managers can best support and start conversations around menopause at work. Research has shown that there are, we are losing some, uh, we're losing many skilled and experienced women from the workplace far too early because of the, the menopause. And one of the things that we are really committed to doing is to give you the tools to enable men and women to have the conversation with their employees. I did mention at the very beginning that this is a business issue. And for me, I also see it as a leadership issue that we all have to work through. So Claire and Tanaj, thank you very much for joining us today. You've both led some research on the menopause in the workplace and impact on women in financial services report, which looks at how the menopause transition affects the progression of women into senior roles in financial services. Could you summarise, and this is out to you, Claire, could you summarise why and how you did the research and what were the key findings? Uh, thanks very much. Hello and um, hello to everyone that's joined the session today. Thank you for inviting me today. Um, so very quickly, just to we'll give you an overview of the research that we published back in October um, the, that we undertook and it, the, the conversation that prompted the research was something that Tanaj and I had um, about 18 months ago. 
So it came from those stories of, well, I know someone that decided not to apply for promotion because she was struggling with the menopause and someone else left altogether the workforce because of the menopause um, and being able not being able to manage the symptoms in the workplace. Um, so Tanaj and I thought there's something more to look at here, which is what kicked off the, the research we've undertaken. Um, and I think what we intended to do is really look at how the issue is affecting women in the sector in a very practical way and come up with some very practical suggestions about how employers can, can support women. So if we move on to the next slide, just very quickly um, about who the Financial Services Skills Commission are, because um, we are a very new organisation. We do what it says on the tin. We represent financial services sector in the UK um, on skills issues. Um, so we look at issues around reskilling, around attraction, um, retention. So the fact that we're looking at um, menopause as a skills issue, as business critical issue, is really important to us because we realise that is something if we don't put the support in place, we are limiting the talent pool that firms can use. Um, but we're, we're across um, all of financial services. We have 32 members that um, employ about 300,000 people across the UK. And you can see a selection of our members on the slide there. But if we move on to the next slide, um, we undertook the research with a report, uh, sorry, focus groups and a survey. Um, and then we did some individual interviews as well. So we had a survey that we invited men and women to complete. Um, we had over 2,400 2, respondents um, and undertook seven focus groups and 10 interviews. Um, I probably should say at this point, I should, I should declare an interest. I'm in my 40s, so I am in the group that is likely to be experiencing the menopause fairly soon. And um, fortunate for me, I have an older sister who I'm now applying for information about how, how it's affecting women in my family. Um, but I think since starting this research, and Tanaj will find the same, or probably report the same, is the amount of people that have come forward to share their stories, to talk about the issues they've faced, positive and negative, has been astounding. And I think it really tells us that this is a, a real hidden issue. If you're interested in the research, it is available on Standard Charter's website and the Financial Services Skills Commission website. We can put the link um, in the chat, um, I'm sure, later. So just getting an idea of the scale. At the moment, the, the, if you take women between the ages of 45 and 55, working in the financial services sector, that's 128,000 women in the UK. That's one in 10 employees. So that's pretty sizable chunk of the workforce who could be uh, going through the menopause at the moment. And with the fact that the sector is facing growing skills gaps, um, retaining any employee is important at the moment. But there's a real big pool of people here who may be thinking about leaving the workforce. And I'll come on to that in a, in a little bit later uh, detail. Um, as I said, I think we, we launched the research. We had so many stories um, that were really positive. But something we may want to come back to, Heather, is, is we were we did have some challenge to our work around entrenching stereotypes of women. Um, and women's sort of hormonal issues, et cetera. But we mm. might come back onto that. It was minor, I have to say. But if we move on to the next slide, um, I'll just go through some of the key areas that we, we um, want to highlight. Um, many women don't know that symptoms they're experiencing is a result of the menopause. Um, it's because it's quite hidden and not spoken about, people don't necessarily put some of the symptoms down to the menopause. If you're not experiencing hot flushes, people seem to not know what's going on. Um, and it can also happen to women under the age of 50. Um, a lot of people thought it was a much older age group. Women have early onset menopause for many reasons. Um, and it can last longer than a few years. Um, it really is very, very different um, for every individual. So there's no one size fits all. Um, a lot of people talked about hot flushes, but actually um, most the most reported symptoms were not hot flushes. They were things like tiredness, night sweats. Mm -hmm aching muscles, they all ranked higher than hot flushes for symptoms that women were struggling with. But there's also non-physical symptoms as well um, that are really important. Difficulty sleeping, worry and anxiety, problems with uh, memory recall and, and difficulty concentrating were really, really highly reported amongst um, women in the survey. Um, so, and we delved into these in the focus groups. Um, we also looked at intersectionality, so women from uh, different different groups, different characteristics. Um, and I think what came out through some of those discussions were that, for example, uh, black women or women of colour and women with disabilities really found that trying to manage menopause symptoms alongside 
other issues of being underrepresented in the workforce, maybe managing other disability challenges, other symptoms, brought an extra layer of challenge to how they're trying to navigate their life at this critical time. So it really did add an additional burden. And for some women, they, they really felt they couldn't, um, they couldn't cope with that. Um, we also talked to women um, in the LGBTQ group um, about some of the challenges they were facing as well. Um, and I think we didn't find huge numbers that we can confidently present findings of, of how the menopause affects those groups of women. But I think what we wanted to do is highlight that this is an area that people should be aware of and maybe in, explore further. Um, one of the key things we did find, though, is that women uh, that women really reported that the menopause impacts on their confidence and ability. They are no less committed as employees, but their uh, ability to that they feel they can work effectively um, and put themselves forward from promotions or, or more challenging work, for example, was really impacted. They spent a lot of time and energy managing their symptoms and trying to keep their levels of productivity as high as possible, um, which shows great commitment and, and resilience. Um, but it really did affect them. It's quite an emotional toll that they were taking with, with this. If we move on to the next slide, um, what we really did find very strongly is that the, the lack of discussion about the menopause, the culture of silence, means that it's hidden. Um, and this just came out so strongly amongst everything. Women really struggling to, to manage symptoms, not having the support, not talking about it, not being able to discuss it openly. And it's a societal challenge as well as, a, as an organisational one. Um, very few felt uh, women felt they could talk to their managers about concerns very often. Um, but interestingly, in the survey we undertook where we asked men as well, we actually found that, that young, younger men in the younger age category felt much more confident to raise concerns in the workplace um, than, than women of the 45 to 55 age category. Um, and you can sort of see on the graph there, it sort of shows the difference between different age groups um, about how feel they can feel that they can talk to their manager about concerns. One of the interesting, really interesting findings was that eight in 10 women don't disclose their menopause status at work. And interestingly, this is not because they think it's a private issue. Um, it's, it's not something they want to share. It's actually because they're worried the stigma that it will create. If they're known to be menopausal, that might create a stigma around them and their career options um, and what they want to do. So the, that is bigger than the fact that it's a private issue. Um, Women that wanted wanted to progress really didn't want to talk about the menopause or them being menopausal. They just thought it would be a blocker. If we move on to the next um, next slide, we looked into whether women would want to leave the workforce early, and there's these. I still find these these statistics quite stark. Forty seven percent of women said the menopause would make them less likely to apply for promotion. And if you remember that we've got 128,000 women in the UK's financial services workforce who, who could be experiencing the menopause in that age category, that 47% is a pretty big number. More of concern is the fact that 25% of women said the menopause is, more, is likely to make them more likely to leave the workforce before they retire. Um, and that's just leaving the workforce altogether because they cannot cope with, with the symptoms which is really a concern because if you, you do the maths, that's a big number. And if any firm looks at the number of women they're employing in that 45 to 55 age category, um, then that could be an impact on your talent pipeline. I think one of the interesting things though to pull out is, as I mentioned before, women are very, very committed to their work and to you know, maintaining their level of productivity and their standards. And they do put extra effort in. And what we did find as well is that there is a real um, uh, desire to progress and a commitment to progress amongst women of menopausal age, this 45 to 55 category. Um, and actually, they, they're more ambitious, if you like, than men of the same age, age group. That was indicated in the survey. Um, but they do feel this lack of confidence does hold them back. So I think it does say that, you know, these aren't employees that are, you know, just, you know, feeling a bit funny and they're just trying to take a back seat. These are really committed individuals that are just navigating something very, very tricky for them. I think it's also interesting to say that when we did the survey, men of the same age group actually reported struggling with some of the same physical and non-physical symptoms, such as difficulty sleeping, lack of memory. Not to the same extent that women of that age group did. I have to say that women did report it to a much, much more stronger degree, greater degree. But I think it does show that some of these challenges are age related. 
And actually, some of the, uh, the the benefits and the changes we're we're suggesting that firms make to support employees in this this age group could have benefits for male and female employees. We are focusing on on women in the menopause, but I think it's worth saying that some of this is around age as well. If we move on, I think we've got some very simple areas that we think firms should take action, um, and none of these are particularly costly or difficult. Um, some instances we've we've had lots of stories about where just simple matters of support and gestures can make a big difference such as if you notice a colleague's having a hot flush in a meeting opening a window or just calling a break in a meeting that allows everyone to take five minutes and you know have a moment to cool down or if you're having a particularly heavy period the women can go to the toilets and, and deal with that so I think some of these small gestures can mean a lot but to achieve that, we need much, much, more, much, much greater awareness, culture and education around the issue, um, providing awareness and information uh, within firms, training managers, mandatory training or voluntary training uh, or a mixture of both um, is really important. And not only um, line managers, but also HR staff, if they're not they're not sufficiently educated or, or trained in this area. Um, publishing a, a policy was mentioned by a lot of people. And, and I know lots of firms do have a menopause policy, but the women in the research and the focus groups are very clear it has to be followed up with action it, it can't just be something on paper um, facilitating support networks um, demonstrating leadership support was was also mentioned um, as well as um, extending private health care uh, to cover menopause symptoms um, I know many firms are looking at this and some already have it in place so that's the first area really getting over um, the, the taboo around the menopause and, and raising awareness um, of the issue and not being afraid to talk about it. I do say that I think everyone's homework from this session is to go and talk to someone in your professional world about the menopause. Just say the word out loud, just start talking about it. Say, I went to something really interesting today on the menopause. Have we thought about this? Do we know if it's affecting anyone? I think just starting to be comfortable with this as an issue is, is a really good first step. The second area where firms can make a difference is around working arrangements and flexibility. Working from home, we're all doing it, um, is fantastically beneficial so that you know, women can manage their symptoms and, and, and how they deal with that. Staggered hours, taking breaks, having breaks between meeting, I already mentioned, um, that, that allows people to have five minutes to, to do what they need to do. Um, so that flexibility, really embedding that into the, the, the DNA of the organisation. And then within a workplace environment, um, we've um, got suggestions around things like quiet rooms, providing desk fans, um, quite simple, but being able to have a desk fan. And if you're in a hot desking environment, maybe having a fixed desk so you can set it up in your own way. We had women talking about how they use post-it notes and reminders because of their brain fog and their difficulty with recall, that they really valued being able to sort of leave that in place and not have to move in a hot desk every, every time they came in the office. Um, things like providing sanitary products in toilets um, and providing layered uniforms. Um, so many of our members at the commission are, are so retail um, banks, so uniforms in a retail bank branch. And um, being able to layer that so you can manage your own your own temperature is really important. Um, but I think the key thing for me is is that awareness and support. Um, do we have to break the stigma around this? If you think five to ten years ago, if if someone came to you. To mention they had struggling with mental health issues um, your answer today would be very different as it was five or ten years ago and I think that's where women with the menopause want to get to that if they're raising an issue I'm struggling with these symptoms um, they will be understood and given support um, and that's where the change needs to come out um, so there's also just one final thing I think that's helpful women were very clear they wanted this to be part of overall well-being work this wasn't a specific women's issue. It does need to come across the organisation and is part of well-being. And as I mentioned before, sometimes these changes could help men who might be struggling with some symptoms, um, maybe struggling with a health issue. You know, how many times do we have a seminar on prostate cancer and dealing with that in the workplace? You know, that's that's for another day, maybe. But I think these these changes that we're advocating for could benefit many, many more employees. So thank you. That's clear. Um, I'd like to ask you, Tanoush, given the organisation you work for, I've been in that organised in that industry for quite a while and I know how difficult it is for them to have those conversations. So I'm really excited that, you know, you're taking this and championing this across Standard Chartered. How can we engage more male managers in helping to recognise and address the issues in supporting women at work during the menopause? 
Can you hear me, Heather? It's because yes. your voice broke a little bit. So uh, I missed uh, the question and uh, a little bit in between, but I think what you were going after was the conversations inside the firm with male Absolutely. managers. Absolutely. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. So thank you first uh, for inviting me and Claire. That was, as always, an excellent presentation. Uh, as, as Claire said, this work started with a conversation. It, uh, uh, it, it was Claire and me sharing examples of women we knew uh, who were, uh, you know, definitely in the almost 50% who gave up promotions, but actually quite a few women we knew were in the 25% of women who took a decision to take a career break completely or get out of executive careers. And, uh, you know, we thought that was simply not okay and we wanted to understand more. The findings of the, the survey has validated what I suspect we intuitively knew all along. But what it's done is it's given us a structure to be able to talk about this topic with more data and with not just anecdotal, but real stories. So it's been a very powerful piece of work. And I genuinely feel very proud to uh, have had the opportunity of uh, both Standard Chartered and me being associated with it. Heather, it's, uh, as you know, Standard Chartered is 100,000 employees in 58 markets, and large part of our footprint is in parts of the world, which I would argue are still a few years behind than the West when it comes to talking about such a, uh, health and well-being broadly and menopause more specifically. So it's been actually quite fascinating to take a UK-specific research but then to, to, to take some of the learnings across all of our markets. And uh, I have to say this, for all of the years that I've been in HR, I've been really very pleasantly surprised at how male managers and male leaders have responded to this. So look, uh, you know, could it be more? Yes, but am I encouraged by the silver lining and the kind of green shoots? Absolutely, I am. So we've had loads of male managers reaching out to us to say, I've been really interested in this topic. I want to talk about this topic to my team. I just don't know how. And, and you know, mm -hmm. can, can you sort of give us some support? And as Claire said, one of the things we did when we launched the survey is we launched a menopause guide. Very simple. What questions to ask, how to create a safe space, just some basic myth busting, you know, just some basic facts around menopause. And putting that toolkit and that guide out uh, has been very empowering for loads of managers, both men and women, to be able to have some of these uh, conversations in a safe environment. What our male managers have also reached out and said is, are there senior women out there who are willing to talk about this mm -hmm. to our teams? You know, could we invite women, even if they're not in our department, could we invite them? And interestingly, we've had loads of senior women who have leaned in to say, yes, I'm very happy to talk about my experience. So, you know, women have blogged about it, women have turned up in other people's meetings to talk about their story. So I think, you know, we are at a very early stage in the journey and we've got loads more to do, but, but I think just putting the research out there, simple guide and toolkit and sharing stories, you know, where we are mm. sharing stories, you know, talking about the great work Heather's doing in the team or Claire is doing in the team, which almost gives the permission and encouragement for a lot of other leaders, both men and women to lean into this debate as well. Mm. Thank you. Well, when we looked at the registration, when the three of us were talking before, we have 828 people registered during the middle of the day to be part of this discussion. So actually, I think you'll all find that this is very, very prevalent to us all at the moment in the workplace. And so how do we how do we really get those conversations going? I can remember many years ago taking this topic to um, a, a round table of very senior male managers. And that time they were all very, very embarrassed. Everybody's face went bright red apart from mine for obvious reasons. And then what I did is I turned it into, actually, gents, what I need you to understand, whilst it's predominantly men that are in this world, you predominantly have women that you are leading. And if we don't address this together on how we can improve things, all those women that you have got earmarked to deliver in your regions will not be there to deliver because they're off. And all of a sudden, everybody picked up their pens and they were ready to go because they started to see this as a real life business issue. So we understand the issue of when we've got young women coming in and the fact that they might feel flexible organisation, inflexible organisations don't allow them to stay and build their careers. So they may make a choice not to stay with us. But then what we have to also take responsibility for is that women who are at that real peak of their career 
who have that breadth of knowledge and experience that if they walk out of our organization within three to six months, we are going to, it's going to cost us a fortune to find them. And on top of that, where is the talent? How are we going to get it? So, so this is really a business issue. So I'm really quite excited that we're having this conversations. And I'm also thinking about how do we get to, how do we get more women to talk more openly about it? Culturally, some of us have been brought up not to even mention the P word, much less and that's periods, much less the M word. Um, but now we're talking about it in the workplace, in the middle of the day, right? So for me, this means that this is a business issue. So how the tools, we've got men now who really want to talk about it because they've got, they're going through it with their wives. They're going through it with their mothers or their sisters, their girlfriends. But actually, they didn't somehow imagine that they'd be going through it with the women that work for them. And so really, I totally agree that we do need to get more women stepping up and saying, actually, I've been through this or this was my experience, even if it's a coffee session that they run with the women in their businesses to get them comfortable talking about it. Like if you've got a headache, you'll say I've got a headache. If you've broken your leg, you say I've broken my leg, I'm not going to be into the office for a little while. Actually, in your end of year review how, or, or you know, monthly one to one with your line manager, how can we get people feeling comfortable on both sides to be able to say to their line manager, look, I may need to just come a little bit later in the mornings just because I'm not sleeping very well at night because I'm going through the menopause. Actually, I think we'll find that there's a very different reception or reaction to that. Just like, you know, if you think about it two years ago, the thought that all of our organisations, particularly financial services, would be all be working from their homes. Somebody would have thought we'd all gone crazy. Two years later, and again this week, everybody's working from their home. And businesses are still striving. So I'd really want us to think about what are the practical tips we can give women in their, in their career to be able to share to young women coming up, older women going through the menopause, but also to the male champions who really want to hold on to the talent. And I'm going to put those two questions out to you first, Claire, and then Tanisha, if you could do that. So maybe talk to us about some of the things you're doing in Standard Chartered. Sure. Thanks, Heather. I mean, I think just coming back to the bigger picture, we Tanaj and I were both very clear this this needed to be positioned as a skills issue to to get businesses to really take notice. That's why we have focused in on on the numbers, on the talent, because at the end of the day, the sector is losing talent because of the menopause, and it doesn't have to. There's some simple things that can be done, um, and we heard some fantastic stories through the research and some really devastating stories as well of, of women that have left. Um, because the support wasn't there and they just have to do it for their own their own well-being. Um, and I think that the practical tips, you know, it does start for me with, with talking about it. Not everyone wants to share their personal story. So I think the opportunity to share some of that in a private space if people want to is really important. But then also, you know, where there are instances where people want to share those stories, and it doesn't have to be from within the organisation, it can be from elsewhere, um, to actually just, just highlight the issue. And I think the, the training point, again, being delivered in in you know a way that's inclusive so people don't feel that you know they're being drummed into this is how you deal with a woman that's got the menopause it is about that inclusive work and that supportive working culture which I know many firms are striving to to curate and improve on um, so there's no there's no sort of you know secret formula I think about this it is it is around that wider conversation and I do I do like the comparison with the mental health conversation because 10 years ago it was very different mm. about mental health. And I think there's a journey. And if you, you went to your manager today and said, I'm struggling with stress or anxiety, you'd get a very different response than you would have done 10 years ago. And that's probably where we need to get to. I think the the interesting point, I mean, I have learned so much. As a woman in her mid-40s, I'm quite embarrassed about how little I knew about the menopause. Before we kicked out this research, I've learned so much. And I think just, you know, generally being able to talk openly about it um, and, you know, and not not be icky and squeamish. You know, we, we talk we don't talk about women's issues. We talk about maternity, menopause and menstruation, just the three M's, you know, two of them just get ignored and we need to change that. Um, but I think that the, the one area which I know we've had some really interest from from men and it's not only men who are managers, women are managers as well. And maybe some women are not comfortable talking about it either. So we need to we need to be inclusive. But the experience of women in others lives, even if you're not experiencing the menopause because you're a man or it's not your time as a woman, um, I think is really important. The amount of men that have come and said, my wife's going through this. I have a sense of how devastating it is. So I really want to make sure I can support the women 
that I manage or I work with. And I think many men have come to this conversation with that that perspective. Um, but for me, it's all about talking. It's all about providing those spaces, public, private, whatever it might be, um, in many different ways for people to talk about this. Thank you. I'm just add, sorry, Heather. Just to yes, sure. Like, first thing is the point that Claire makes, which I completely agree with. I mean, this is a broader well-being and a broader inclusion issue. And you know, I genuinely believe that firms that you know do create that open environment, that 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 safe space for conversations to happen, will become more inclusive workspaces for everyone. And I, you know, I. I think that's a really important point uh, uh, to make. And again, some of the best practices that have been coming out, companies that have done it well, have focused on broader inclusion in the workplace uh, and broader well-being in the workplace. And 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 supporting w women through menopause transition is a part of uh, of those endeavors. So so I think for me that's the first point to make. I mean, for me, uh, and again, Claire has touched on this. We have looked at our action planning in this space in two broad buckets. The one is what I call inclusive policy, flexible working. Can we have leave adjustments? You know, can we provide, um, you know, cold rooms? Can we provide so, so basic support? You know, extra uniforms for women who are in frontline sort of roles. So the, these are inclusive policies. Uh, and the other thing, the other set of bucket of actions that we have looked at is education, awareness, and skill building, which is both via the menopause guide that I did, but actually we have upskilled our lean in circles and our employee resource network groups globally to provide those smaller group support as well, right? Because, you know, the, the, you, you, as, as uh, a few people have said in the chat, Heather, you said it culturally, you know, I, I come from a part of the world where it, it would still take a while, I think, for this to be very openly discussed and spoken about. And in some of those markets, what we have done is we've already tapped into lean in circles or employee resource network groups, but upskill them, given them basic upskilling to be able to provide that space in, in uh, to, to provide that safe space and peer to peer coaching, peer to peer mm -hmm. support, uh, which I think is quite valuable as well. So inclusive policies, Education awareness are the two big buckets that we have looked at to look at uh, a range of uh, uh, action planning. Thank you. I'm conscious of time and we did lose some time because of the technical difficulties. But I do want I've just had a look at one or two of the questions. And I think there's one question I'd really like to, to bring out and bring to both of you. We both talked about talent at both sides. Someone's put a question in there around what do we do around organisations, around the attraction of women in their mid 50s into organisations as well, which is the recruitment piece. I think that's so important. Um, so can I ask Claire for you to answer and then you Tanuj on that? Because I think I'm, I'm interested in what you do in Standard Chartered as well, um, Tanuj. Yeah, I think it's a it's a good it's a good question, and I think um, it's probably not just women. I think it's any any worker in their fifties mm. that can affect men as well, and, and whether ageism plays a part in in you know what firms have firms think about recruitment. And it's not it's not a firm point. It's you know at the end of the day, there's a, there's a manager that that does you know makes a decision on recruitment, and and how does that play in? Um, and it was really interesting. I was talking to someone this morning um, that someone who had, had left the workforce. Um, I think through a redundancy and was trying to get another role, you know, given the talent challenges that that's been go going on right now and, you know, the absolute mad competition for talent and, you know, in, in increasing salaries, et cetera, this individual couldn't get a role. And what they did is, is end up spending quite a bit of the last year reskilling around data and, and um, tech um, areas, so data mm. analytics in particular. Now they're very, very, very attractive as an as a individual. I think firms probably have got further to go on this. Um, I think it is an area that hasn't been been focused on and is important. Um, although there's a lot of schemes like returnships, which tended mm. to be started to focus on women who may be returning from having a break to look after children, not exclusively women. Um, but whether that can be expanded into, into other areas. Um, Barclays Bank, for example, have a, a really good programme called Boulder, Be Older, um, which is an apprenticeship programme. And I think their oldest apprentice is, is in their 60s, um, someone that's come into the organisation. So some firms are looking at this as a structured route mm. into the business. Um, but I think there's a bit more to be done. Thank you. And Tanoosh, because I think with that, it's all around the culture of us educating. So I think I mentioned at the very beginning that education was key with all of this. But it's about educating 
our recruitment recruitment hires and the people in the business in terms of what it is that they're looking for and the skills that could bring just in the same way that we don't want to exclude people who are too young by saying they need a they you know they need more skin in the game i've heard it said oh they need you know at least another 20 years to actually get to where we need them to we need to move away from that start thinking about the skills that we need here and now and the experience that people bring so just before i hand to you if i think about technology right now the young people that are coming up they've grown up with technology that is their life so actually they bring something into an organization but having said that we've got people who weren't brought up in the era of technology but they have a wealth of skills that are very valuable to organizations so how do we bring those two together so that in an organization we are getting the best of both worlds I mean, I'll take two, uh, two lenses to this, Heather. I will start off by saying that the returnership programs, as they are typically called, right? I mean, where, you know, women who've taken a career break or been out and are, you know, late 40s, 50s want to come back. There's a, there is a range of programs out there. My assessment is that the programs have had limited success. So, you know, you, you know, we run programs, they are out there, you know, you, you hire one or two women and, you know, you, you showcase them internally. Uh, from my own experience, I think it's disappointing how little progress has been made. And I think one of the reasons is, yes, you can do the education of recruiters and you can do the education of people leaders. But if culturally you don't provide that transition support when you yeah. hired them, there is tissue rejection. And I've, so I have piloted several of these programs in multiple markets that I worked in. And yes, we've had some great stories that have been put on the company intranet uh, and interviews. But if you've gone down a year later and tracked yeah. your careers, it, it hasn't been. So what we are trying to do is do a massive a transition program which supports uh, the mid-career hires, as we call them, you know, especially the people who've taken a career break, men, but largely women, let's be honest, and assimilate that them back. So that's one. The other piece I will say comes back to this whole, uh, the heart of the skills agenda that, that Claire and all of us who are involved with F FS uh, International Skills Commission are championing. One of the big pieces of work that we are doing, which I would really encourage people to think about, is internally looking at how. Hello. Technology has really been playing games with us today. Um, perhaps until Salouche comes back, I could put, pose a question to you. Oh, she's back. <laughs> I got kicked out and get back. <laughs> One of the things that we are doing, Heather, and it's coming back to your question, is directing our reskilling efforts internally to women to get them upskilled on areas like data, data, yeah. cyber technology, where we don't have enough women. So, you know, the, the reality, if you look at cybersecurity, which is becoming such a hot area to recruit in banks, it's just not enough women. But we've got enough women internally who've got adjacent skills and with the right level of uh, reskilling effort training. and actually training, we can actually get them up. So we've now got very targeted programs where we are training women internally to get them into areas of the bank where we just don't have enough women. And if you don't do something about it now, the gap will just become wider and wider over the next few years. Thank you. That is such a key point for us to end on. As I thought, we would run out of time. This is such an important discussion. I almost feel, ladies, as though we need to come back in the new year with another session on this because I think this is not going to go away. We've opened up a can of worms that's actually becoming a can of money because we can start to see, both of all, the responsibilities we have as leaders men and women, the responsibilities we have as individuals, but also we've heard from you, Tanush, the investment that you were, you and many organisations want to make in upskilling and retaining um, their talent. So what I want to do at this point is hand back over to our chair, just to close things. A very special thank you to both of you in that consolidated time. We had so much to cover, but I'm so glad you were able to bring up those key points around why you both com were committed to doing that research. And I thank you for being bold because this is what this is about. We're being bold now. We're taking topics that ordinarily 
and um, we would leave in a little box somewhere for someone else to deal with and we're bringing it into the business world and once again we're adding the pound shillings and pence around it so people can see the value and i have to say as soon as people understand that there is a commercial value to this and the war on talent we will take them on our journey. So thank you so much. And I am going to ask you to come back again in the new year because we're not finished. And over to you, Claire. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Heather. And thank you very much, Claire and Tanoush, um, for, for attending a really, really insightful uh, session. And thank you for sharing the research findings. Um, don't forget, if you're a member of CMI, you can log on to Management Direct using the link in the live chat, where there's a whole range of exclusive and practical development resources and much more. Um, you can also um, sign up to our free CMI newsletter um, and if you're not yet a, a member or subscriber, join our community via the link in the uh, chat to gain access to our full Management Direct portal. So thank you again to everybody and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.